you know, I really got to thinking about this poster that I've seen. All these kids want to believe there's some kind of something there at Area 51. They want to think that there's actually aliens there, there's spacecraft, there's something there. And as I listened to them, I thought, you know, they're all looking for something different, something interesting, something new, some kind of secret hidden wisdom. And it goes back to something that we've talked about. Everybody wants to know the truth. And everybody feels like there's something being kept from them. And then I listened to an interview the other day with this guy. Dan Aykroyd, hilarious comedian, great actor, but throughout the interview I was listening to him talk about some things he believes in. And he talked about how he believes in mediums, that he's heard these two ladies that could predict the future and tell things. And uh, he believes in spirits and ghosts. He actually touched a ghost one time and that gave him the idea for the entirety of Ghostbusters. And then he started talking about, yeah, alien encounters. He, he's a real avid studier of alien encounters and how he absolutely believes there's UFOs because, you know, we have all these undocumented things, but how could all these people be wrong? And then even Bigfoot, yes, I've heard a couple convincing things about Bigfoot. And Bigfoot, you know, in these uninhabited parts of uh, southwestern Canada, you know, with these huge expanses, I think Bigfoot's out there. And I'm thinking, good grief. He believes all this stuff. And then at the end of the interview, he's, he's like, do you not catch any flack? He's like, well, I don't care if I catch any flack for it. He's like, people, you know, believe in a religion. They believe in something out there that can't be proved either. What's different than me believing this? And that really struck me. How do we appear to different to skeptics than someone who believes in these supernatural things or these aliens? You know, what gives us any more validity than thinking, wow, that's some crazy stuff that Dan Ackerwood believes. What makes it any different that I believe there's a grand creator of the universe out there that I don't have direct, tangible proof of, that I have to have faith in? You know, is this us? Are we just wanting to believe? Is our faith built on something more than, I want there to be a God, so there's a God. I've believed my whole life there's a God, so there's a God. I've gone to church my whole life, and I don't want that to be wasted. There's a psychological uh, situation. I, don't, I can't think of the word I want to use for it. Um, it's called the sunk cost fallacy. And it's once you've put so much time and effort into something, even if you see that it's going to be unfruitful, you don't want to give up because you've put so much time and effort into it. Do we fall into that as Christians that I've spent my whole life in the church, even if I can't prove it, I can't have wasted all of my life, all of those Sunday mornings, all of that time. Are we tricking ourselves into being Christians or do we have some solid backbone to put our faith on? If our faith is a blind faith, then we're no different than Dan Aykroyd believing in the things he wants to believe. We have to have a reason to believe what we believe. And secondly, if you'll turn with me to Matthew, Matthew 10, verse 16. This is Jesus talking to His apostles as He sends them out. And this verse just really struck me when I read it, that this is us as we go into these people and talk to these people. Because in our community, most people believe in Christianity and we are trying to convince them that maybe some of the doctrine they believe is wrong, maybe some of the theology that they've accepted is wrong. But in general, they believe there's a God. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. In our area, that's, that's not much up for debate. But right here in Matthew 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep into the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For it will be given to you in the hour when you, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who speaks in you. And he goes on to give examples of how it will be difficult for them to talk to these people. Now we don't have divine inspiration as these apostles did, but through study and through learning this kind of material 
and through biblical study and actual scriptural study, we can have the information that we need to be as shrewd as serpents, but as gentle as doves as we present this material to others. And that's what I really want us to get out of this study. Yes, I want this to strengthen our faith, but I also want this to be an opportunity for us as the church to put ourselves in the most positive light that we can when we talk to others. If we are unprepared to talk to someone about any topic, we usually come off as defensive, scared. You know, anytime you're nervous about something or scared about something, you're a little more timid, you're a little more defensive, you're on edge. If we feel that we're confident in what we believe, we have a firm understanding of why we believe it, we will be much more comfortable talking to anyone about this. And that's what I hope we get out of this study right now, is that I'm trying to help us build a knowledge base where we feel more comfortable talking about these things. And so finally we get to some of the topics that you probably expected to see in this lesson. So first I want to preface this by saying this lesson is to hopefully give us the understanding of what evolutionists believe. This lesson is not, today's lesson is not to refute it. It is not to say, here's the problems with it. That's going to be next week. We will talk about some of the issues. So if you're expecting during this lesson to hear, here's how evolution's wrong, we're not going to get to that necessarily today. That's, it's, going, it's more than one week. I mean, this could be an entire quarter or year in itself. So I'm trying to shrink it down as much as I can, but this week is kind of hoping that we have a better understanding of what they believe as opposed to necessarily why we shouldn't believe it. So make sure you're here next week for the second half of it. All right, so in this lesson, I want to outline what is evolution, where did it come from, is there any credence or validity to it, how should we approach it, and just some remaining questions and considerations about it. So, like I said, this lesson, we will not be getting to necessarily some of the flaws, arguments. I just want us to really have an understanding of what they believe because, you know, you would want to sit down and discuss this vice versa with someone who believes in evolution. You would hope they would have a little understanding about where you come from. It would make things a lot easier in that discussion. And if we don't understand what they believe and we have these preconceived notions based on what we think evolution is trying to tell us, then you know, we may put ourselves in a position where we look unintelligent or we look um, ill-prepared to have the discussion. And you may turn people off because if they feel like you don't have enough intelligence to understand what they're saying or if you, they feel like you don't have enough understanding of their viewpoint, then they may not be as receptive to the gospel. So. Genesis 1, 20 through 27. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth and in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly, after their kind, and every winged fowl after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And let evening and morning, and that evening and morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after its kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth and if after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he them. Male and female he created them. This is where our understanding comes from for how earth came to be on this planet. And even before this verse, we see the first life come with plants and the other living things. And this was the generally accepted view in the West from the time of Moses all the way through the mid-1800s. And it wasn't until the 1800s in this age of enlightenment where you had science really coming into its own and saying, let's look at things empirically, let's look at the facts that we can find, let's observe what we can observe and make smart inferences based off of those facts and those observations that we are left with what we now have as the theory of evolution. And one thing that needs to be stressed here is it is a theory. And no one really want, will go further than that. When we, have, we talk about in science, we talk about laws and we talk about theories. 
So in my class, we just finished studying the three laws of motion, Newton's three laws of motion. And in those laws, we see that they are replicable over time, and every single time we have proof and mathematical proof and observable proof that these are true. You know, this right here, this clicker is not going to move unless a force acts upon it. That's Newton's first law. As soon as I push it, it moves. And it will move forever in the same direction until something stops it. Friction stops it so it doesn't move anymore. We can observe that. And so we refer to them as laws. When we talk about theories in science, we're talking about things that are not provable, but that science feels they have a very good understanding of and have a, very, and have a lot of faith in. That's a good way to put it, is that they have a lot of faith in that observation and that inference from there. And so this is the main reason this is important to us in this area. This is the Alabama course of study for seventh grade science. This isn't the whole course of study. This is one standard that I pulled that is taught in every public school in Alabama and is required by every teacher that teaches seventh grade science to teach. So if you'll look at it, you'll notice that over here we have the vocabulary that teachers have to use. Relative dating, fossil, evolve, extinct, mass extinction, analogous structures, homologous structures, diversity, vestigial structures, species, speciation, anatomical, structure, anatomical structures, and chronology, or chronological. By looking simply at those words, you get the gist of what's being implied. When you start noticing that it's talking about relative dating, chronological, it's setting a sequence of things that are going to occur. From what we just read in Genesis, this sequence took two days. What we read here is obviously not referring to two days of creation. It says, students know that oldest fossils are found deeper in the earth, younger fossils are found closer to the surface. If everything was created at one time, you would expect to see all different types at you know, different levels. Life evolved from simple to more complex forms of life. Periodic extinctions occurred throughout the history of the earth. Fossils found closer to the surface more resemble modern species. Bacteria today closely resembles early fossils. Fossils of transitional species exist and suggest evolution from one species to another, and e.g. whale hind leg bones. And we'll talk about some of that next week and the weeks to come. But this is being taught to every student in the state of Alabama that is one of the most Christian states in the Union. If this is what's being taught in our state, what do you think it looks like elsewhere? And I taught seventh grade science three years ago. And I was required to teach this. And the way I approached it is just what I told you. This is a theory. A theory is not a law. A theory is a belief that some people have. I don't necessarily agree with it. And if you'd like to ask me about what I believe outside of class, you're welcome to do so but I'm not at liberty to discuss my personal beliefs to all of you. And 99.9% .9 of the students I taught knew exactly what I was talking about when I said that, and I didn't have to say any more. It is important to understand what the science community believes. I mean, I think we're all pretty pleased to have something like this in our pocket. This comes from science. It's pretty nice to come in here and sit in an air-conditioned building without bugs and things crawling around on us. Science gives us a lot of great things. And it helps us live in a modern world that has all kinds of wonderful inventions and things, and I expect science to continue. You know, I'm, a, I'm an optimist when it comes to scientific research. I think that we just are gonna see improvements and improvements. But it's when we get into things like this that I'm afraid sometimes we fall down a as we talked about the calf path a few weeks ago, we get on the wrong path and we can't see the forest for the trees and we keep going down the path because we don't know where else to go. So, the basic idea for evolution came from the origin of the species. It was published by Charles Darwin. He lived from 1809 to 1882 and he finally published this book in 1859. So, Charles Darwin set sail, he was a wealthy uh, Englishman, and he set sail on the HMS Beagle 
is, he was a mediocre student in college and he did okay pulling a lot of C's. He graduated with a degree and he went and started exploring South America and some of the areas around the world. And as he traveled around, he saw variations in different animals and he was pulling, uh, making sketches and showing different types of animals that he could see as he traveled. And what he found is this idea of speciation. And a guy who came well before him, about 100 years before him, named Carl Linnaeus, was a Swede. And he lived from 1707, 1707 to 1778. He came up with a taxonomy. And a taxonomy is a way of classifying things. If you want to classify things, if you go to Walmart, they have a taxonomy. You don't go to the grocery aisle to get a screwdriver. You know when you go in Walmart, they have it classified where you can find things easily based on the department you're looking in. A taxonomy is just a way of classifying things. And he wanted to have a system for identifying different living things on the earth. You know, you wouldn't expect to look in the plants for a jellyfish or you wouldn't look in the fungi for a turtle. And this was kind of the idea, is if they could figure out a way of classifying things, because obviously a horse and a mule are closer together than you would say a horse is to a parakeet. And the idea was if you could find commonalities between living things, you could create a taxonomy or a way of classifying um, living things to where it would make more sense. And now this is not the exact way he uh, designed it, but this is what we have currently as accepted in science. As we start with a species, and you spread it out a little bit more, and you get the genus, family, order, class, phylum, and kingdom. And for most of you, if you're my age or older, that's all you saw in school. What we have done now is we had the five kingdoms when I was a kid. I don't even remember how many there are now. It's six, seven, or eight. I don't remember. But in just 15 years from me being in, or I guess 17 years from me being in the eighth grade, we've changed this. We've now added domain above it. And domain was just because there was a disagreement in the way bacteria was classified. And so instead of having bacteria as it was, now they've split it into two different kinds of bacteria. And I don't know nearly enough about bacteria to get into any of that. Um, and then above it, we see life. And that would just constitute all the living things on the planet. This system was set up not as a, an attack on Christianity. It was not set up as proof of evolution. This is 100 years before evolution was even thought of. This was just simply a way of identifying and classifying things. And the idea is a species is the smallest unit we have of that. And a species is the basic unit of classification and a taxonomic rank of an organism, as well as a unit of biodiversity. A species is often defined as the largest group of organisms in which any two individuals of the appropriate sexes or mating types can produce fertile offspring. And we're going to look at some examples of how speciation has some variability in a moment. But for the most part, we understand when we're talking about an animal or a plant, you know, if we look at a tree outside, we know that this is an oak tree or a maple tree or an elm. And we can see that if we look at different kinds of animals, we know that, you know, this bird is a cardinal or that that dog is, well, a dog. It's, you know, uh, comes from the wolf and we now have domesticated dogs. So here's examples of species. This is all one species. All dogs came from wolves. And whether it's a Great Dane or a Chihuahua, and we see that the Great Dane's skull is bigger than the whole Chihuahua. That is one species. Those are breeds. And this is the first thing I want us to understand about evolution. What science proclaims is what I would consider macroevolution. This idea that all living things came from a single-celled organism over millions of years. There is not, in my opinion, enough substantial evidence to believe that. However, to me there is undeniable evidence that microevolution exists. And this is adaptation. And there's two ways that we can get microevolution. But before that, I want to show you some other interesting things. These are hybrids. These are animals that have two parents of different species. And you say, well, how is it possible that you have an animal that has one parent of one species and the other parent of another? And it's because the key to being a species is you have to produce fertile offspring. These animals here are sterile. They cannot produce offspring. This is a zeonk, so it's a donkey 
and a zebra. We have a liger, a tiger, and a lion. These are growler bears. One parent was a polar bear, one parent was a grizzly bear. I don't remember how you say these, but one parent was a leopard and the other one was a lion. Uh, everybody knows the mule and then a beefalo. That's a buffalo and a cow that have been bred together. And to my knowledge, the only one of these that is naturally occurring is a growler bear. Because in Alaska and in North and in Western Canada, you actually have areas where the polar ice caps are shrinking. And as this happens, polar bears are forced south. And as they're forced south, they have fewer mating opportunities, and yet you're in grizzly bear territory, and so they will do the best they can, and they will mate with the grizzly bear. So you do actually have growler bears that are found in nature. And the rest of these, to my knowledge, are artificially selected and bred together by people. And so this is kind of the differentiation of a species. Once we hit species level, yes, they can produce offspring, but you can't have two mules breed. They're not going to be able to. They're sterile. I believe there is a very, very fractionally small chance that they can, but it is very unlikely that you'll be able to breed them. So, back to Charles Darwin. This guy right here, his name was Herbert Spencer, and he read, he was a, I believe he was a friend or associate of Charles Darwin, and he came up with the term that really became one of the keys to the idea of evolution. And this was survival of the fittest. The idea was that more offspring is produced than the environment can sustain. And so what happens is the strong live, the weak die, and you're left with the adaptations and the strengths of the strongest. You know, we see in people, we see variation. We see people that are tall, my dad's 6'5", I'm not so lucky. Um, we see variation with athleticism, we see variation with different diseases or genetic traits, and we see that usually people who inherit traits that would be debilitating or that would be um, fatal, well, they don't get passed along in the gene pool. They survive one generation and that offspring usually is unable to reproduce because they've either died before they've hit the ability to or because they have something that you know, society would deem as undesirable. Well, it's the same thing for all animals. The best traits are what will be carried on. If you were in the African savanna, and the leaves are way up high, the tallest giraffes are going to be the healthiest. Giraffes whose necks aren't long enough to reach the leaves, they're going to starve, they're going to die. And over time, you will see species be able to make changes over time, and the populations will take on the traits of those healthiest parents. And this was the entire idea that was come up with, is that it's survival of the fittest. This is my dog, Sadie. Morgan's had her since she was in elementary school. She's not exactly the fittest of creatures. She would not make it more than 25 minutes outside in the summer. She's not going to be able to catch anything to eat. She's going to starve in no time. She's not very fit. But conversely, she's 16 years old and still going strong. You know, when you put people in an environment, when you put in creatures in the correct environment, you know, some strengths may arise that would not necessarily you have found other places, and this is why we find different animals in different habitats. You can't take a penguin to the equator, or a, at least an uh, Arctic penguin to the equator and expect it to make it very long. And this is kind of the idea. We see that a Shih Tzu is a dog that has been bred by people. You were never naturally going to have a Shih Tzu running around in the, in, in the nature. You know, the traits that she possesses are not very good for running down prey out in the woods. And so to summarize the origin of the species, what Darwin said is more individuals of a species are born than can possibly survive. Slight advantages are passed on through natural selection. Descent with modification was the term he continuously used that said good traits stay and bad traits go away. And he also made many points in this that we sometimes don't think of. He never mentioned God or theology a single time in this book. And he admits there are flaws with his idea. He never saw transitional periods. He never saw where you can actually go from a plant to a fungus or from a fungus to an animal, anything like that. He said these were missing, and he didn't have the answer, but he wanted to get this idea out in the public. And he sat on this idea for a long time. I believe it was 20 years he sat without publishing this work because he was afraid of the backlash. Because in a Christian society, who wants to be told, well things may not be as it was read in Genesis. 
And I figure that's why he didn't approach theology or anything like that, because he didn't, he'd grown up going to be a clergyman. And this is the idea that he arrived at. As he uh, sailed around the HMS Beagle and the Galapagos Islands, he noticed these finches. And on each island, there would be a different type of beak. And he noticed that every one of the beaks was perfectly suited to the environment of that island. On some of the islands, they were eating grubs out of a, uh, out of a tree. On some of them, they were eating berries. On some of them, they were eating leaves. And whatever the vegetation was or whatever the food source was on that island, their beaks were perfectly adapted to it. And so on the right-hand column, you can see the way that he viewed it. If it didn't work, if it was an unfavorable mutation or trait, that finch died out and only the ones that fit that environment survived. And through that process, he arrived at this idea. This is artificial selection. This is what we do. You know, we've domesticated animals from very much of human society. We have, even ancient Egypt, there was domesticated cats and dogs have been around as long. And what we see is over time, People have bred them to have different traits. You want a big dog? You can breed them to have a big dog. Take two big dogs, let them breed, have bigger dogs. You want a tiny little dog? Take small dogs, breed them together. And over generation after generation, you can arrive at those traits. What we don't see is a change in species. Dogs are still dogs, no matter what you breed. Going back to Sadie, there's no way that this is what you would arrive at naturally. You know, she wouldn't survive in the environment. But in a home where she's fed and given water and taken care of, she's fine. And this is why dog breeds, you can find a wolf, you can find a coyote, you can find, and I realize coyotes are a different species, and they can produce sterile offspring as well with dogs sometimes. But the breeds that we see, some of them are not gonna be conducive for living out in nature. Some of them can run around and be fine, but others can't, and that's because they're artificially bred for certain traits that are desirable to people. So this is what Darwin found, is he went around these different islands. Each of the islands he went to would have a different type of beak. Now, as I said, this one, he would be able to hold a stick and use a stick with his beak and stick it down inside a hole and tap around until he pulled a grub out on it on others. They were able to eat insects, and their beak was designed to be able to uh, get into insects' exoskeleton. Uh, this one could eat leaves, and the idea was they all came from the same finch that ate seeds. And he says that he arrived at the idea that these were actually different species, and I'm sure they are. I'm sure they're probably not genetically able to reproduce. But the idea was that they all came from this, and he seemed to have this stroke of insight and I'll come back to that in a moment, but I want to show you this. This was the sketch that he actually drew that came up with this idea. And he just kind of, and he just wrote at the top, I think. And then he went through and realized that maybe if you start out with one branch, and it's like a tree, it forks, and you see this divide, and they go one way and they go another, and the bad die off and the good are left. And this was the idea that he arrived at. And then here's an interesting example of this in action. This is from the 1800s. During the Industrial Revolution, the peppered moth was this black color that you see right here. There were occasionally some that had that peppered color to them. But as the 18, actually, I'm sorry, it was the reverse. They were this gray color, and they would blend in with the trees. And as the Industrial Revolution began in the 1800s and the production of smoke and the production of tar and all the chemicals and smog in the air, the trees got sooty and took on a black color. Well, if you were a gray moth, suddenly you were very visible to any predator that might eat you. And over time, all the gray moths were eaten up. But the black ones, the very small percentage of the population that were black, they now blended in with the black trees and their population began to increase. And then when the Industrial Revolution had kind of scaled back and electricity had taken over, it wasn't quite so crude production methods, it's reverted back to kind of a mix of both. Environments can produce different outcomes. You know, it's kind of like if you work out. You work out because you get stressed, you stress your muscles and you can get bigger. 
whatever you put your emphasis in, whatever you know is needed by the environment, we can adapt to it. Humans especially are very adaptable. Um, and that's what happened with this environment here. The things that help some parts of the peppered moth species to uh, reproduce, they reproduced. The others were eaten before they could. And so these are the ideas that led to this idea that is now commonly accepted in science. And this is called the phylogenic tree. And the idea is that if we take Darwin's idea of branching, and we can see within a species, we can see this. You have dogs, and as you have a wolf, you can branch them off by traits to get whatever you want in a dog. But then they've made this logical leap. Darwin came up with the idea, and then others have run with it, that you can expand that out beyond a species. And they trace it through the entirety of life, through all the domain, through all the kingdoms, phylum, class, order, family, and genus. They now believe that you can create this phylogenic tree and place any living thing within a framework where it all came from one living organism millions of years ago. So, next week, what I want to look at is the validity of these arguments, misconceptions and flaws, and how we should approach it as Christians. We've got about two minutes. Are there any questions, thoughts, concerns? I know that's a lot of information and we ran through it really fast. But anything you may want to say? Yes? Mm -hmm. We have the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's... And then, like you said, in evolution, do I believe in evolution? Yes. My mm -hmm. Right. You know, the, the odds that a protein or, you know, amino acids rather, in a primordial pool with the deliverance of energy. I don't know what the latest is, but decades ago... Oh, we're going to talk about the Uri Miller experiment and things like that. Yeah. Don't worry. Okay, well, decades ago I was taught that if you take amino acids and you try and develop DNA or RNA with energy, the odds of that happening are the same odds as me taking a bucket of um, billiard balls. What well, was it, 1 through 15? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> a bucket of, of billiard balls, dumping them on a pool table, and having them all land, and then and then form a perfect rack triangle on the dock. Mm -hmm. Same odds. Yep, we're going to get into some of that as we go. Thank you for listening. <laughs>